As we concluded our time together, John asked if I would give him a priesthood blessing. I responded that I would gladly give such a blessing, but I first needed to ask some questions. I then posed questions I had not planned to ask and had never previously considered. John, do you have the faith not to be healed? Testing one, two, three, testing one, two, three. This is Radio Free Mormon on the air, broadcasting behind enemy lines. Tonight's episode Faith Not to Be Healed, or A Wish for Blessings That Work. The first part of that title, Faith Not to Be Healed, you may have thought you heard incorrectly or that I said it wrong. Shouldn't I have said faith to be healed? Isn't that the scriptural injunction given by a priesthood holder to someone who is about to be healed? If they have faith to be healed, then they will be healed? No, actually, I meant to say faith not to be healed because I am not quoting from the New Testament. Instead, I am quoting from Elder Bednar four years ago in a worldwide devotional that he gave. We'll get to that talk by Elder Bednar and why it is that he should say faith not to be healed instead of faith to be healed in the second part of this podcast. The first part of this podcast will deal with the alternate title to this episode, A Wish for Blessings That Work. Now that title may be a bit obscure to some of my listeners, so let me take a minute to unpack it. Back in the 1980s, there was a famous comic strip called Bloom County. In that comic strip was a character named Opus. Opus was a penguin. And Opus, like most penguins, had two wings, but those wings really didn't work. By which I mean he could not use them to fly. All birds have wings, and most birds can use those wings to fly, but Opus, being a penguin, had wings, but they didn't work. He couldn't use them to fly. So there was a Christmas episode that was done of Bloom County back in the 1980s, and it was called A Wish for Wings That Work. Opus had the wings, but they didn't work, and his wish was to have a pair of wings that would work so that he could fly. In a similar way, all worthy men in the LDS Church hold the priesthood. They can prove that they hold the priesthood because most of them have a little card that has their name on one end of it and on the other end is the name of Jesus Christ and in between are all the steps between Jesus Christ and them that show an unbroken chain of authority from Jesus Christ to the priesthood holders. So there is no question but that the worthy men in the church do in fact hold the priesthood. The question is not whether they hold the priesthood for purposes of this episode, but rather whether they have a priesthood that works. They may have a priesthood even as Opus the penguin had wings, but what I want to talk about tonight is whether the priesthood that the men have in the church is any more effective than the wings that Opus the penguin had. Now, it's an easy thing for a penguin to know if the penguin is flying or not. The penguin flaps his wings, and if he leaves the ground, then he's flying. If he doesn't leave the ground, he is not flying. But with the priesthood, it's not always so easy to see whether the priesthood is working. For instance, I was blessed to baptize a number of people on my mission in Japan. But I will tell you that there is very little difference in the appearance of a person before they get baptized and the same person after they get baptized. Now, we all know and understand that by the power of the priesthood and the atonement that a person who is baptized has their sins washed away. But there is no difference in the appearance of a person who has their sins washed away from a person who is simply chock full of sin. They look identical. There is no way of telling by outward observation whether that priesthood authority has actually done what it claims to do. We take it as a matter of faith. The same thing happens with the blessing of babies. The same thing happens with the blessing on the sacrament. The same thing happens with confirmation and bestowing the gift of the Holy Ghost. There is simply no way of telling whether the priesthood is actually doing anything or whether it's something that we're simply all agreeing to believe together and going through a ritual that really has no effect. The exception to this rule is blessings of healing by the power of the priesthood. Because generally speaking, a person who is healed by the power of the priesthood will look, act, and sound much different after the blessing than before the blessing. 
there will be a distinct difference. There will be an observable difference. We can tell in that case whether priesthood power is actually working and operative by whether or not the person who is blessed actually does get healed. Here I want to share with you an experience I had when I was six years old at Christmas time. It was Waco, Texas. That's where I lived with my family. And my parents had a neat trick for how it was that they had their three boys write their letters to Santa. What we were told to do was to go through the Sears catalog, pick out the things that we wanted Santa to bring us, write them down in our letter to Santa, describe them using the title used in the catalog, and even write down next to the item the page number on which this item appeared in the catalog. We were assured that this is how Santa could keep track of things and how Santa would make sure that he was actually bringing us the toy that we wanted. Well, this one year, 1966, I had a fascination with Superman. The thing I loved about Superman was that he could fly. Every afternoon in my big brother's bedroom, we would watch his black and white TV and we would watch reruns from the 1950s TV show called Superman. As a six-year-old, I was not interested in the plot of the story. I was not interested in what was going on at the Daily Planet with Lois Lane and Jimmy Olsen and Perry White. I wasn't interested in the dialogue that they had back and forth. In fact, I pretty much tuned that out. What I was waiting for with anticipation was the point in every show when George Reeves would duck out of sight for a second, change into a Superman costume, and fly off into the air over the city and beat up the bad guys. That was all I cared about. And believe me, every day when I watched that show, I was not disappointed. I wanted to fly so badly. And I knew in my six-year-old mind that if I had a Superman costume, I could fly too, just like George Reeves did on the TV. So this Christmas, 1966, I'm six years old, I'm going through the Sears catalog, and what do I find? I find a Superman costume. I put it in my letter to Santa, I described the article, I made sure to put down the page number it could be found in the Sears catalog, and I sent it off to the North Pole, and lo and behold, on Christmas morning, I opened up my Christmas gift, and what to my wondering eyes should appear but a Superman costume. I will never forget that Christmas morning. As quickly as I could, I got away from the rest of the family, went to my room, changed into my Superman outfit, went out into the front yard of our home with the intent of giving my Superman costume a run around the block, preferably at 50 to 100 feet up. I took several deep breaths, took three steps, and jumped into the air with authority. You see, I knew that I would be able to fly with that Superman costume. Faith did not even enter into the equation. The faith was so strong that it approached, yea, it was verily, a perfect knowledge of my ability to fly. But much to my surprise, I didn't fly. I came back to earth with a thump, and I stood there wondering what on earth happened. My first thought was, do I have the costume on right? Is everything in place? Did I somehow put on the pants backward? I checked myself, and I found, no, the costume was on correctly. I went back, and I took another three steps, jumped into the air with my hands over my head with a little less optimism, and a little less surety this time, and I came back to earth once more. Again, I thought, have I done something wrong? Am I taking my steps the wrong way or out of order? I had it pretty well memorized as to what George Reeves did in the Superman show and the three steps that he would take, just like he was going to take a dive off the high board. Three steps, boom, up. I tried it again. I did it exactly right. I did it just the way that George Reeves did it in the TV show. The third attempt failed as well. I was one depressed little six-year-old Texas boy wearing a Superman costume in his front yard on Christmas morning. I turned around, I went back into the house, and I did not tell anybody about my disappointing failure in the front yard to fly. Disappointment is too small a word. I was crushed that I could not fly. This is what I had been aiming for. This is what I had been hoping for. This is what I had been dreaming of. And this is what I had an absolute confidence in my heart of hearts that I would be able to do. But all the faith in the world could not make me fly. Well, maybe that's because I was only six years old, I was not a Mormon, and I did not have the priesthood. Flash forward to 1978. When I'm 18 years old, I am baptized into the LDS church fresh out of high school. The reason I get baptized is mainly through the influence of my best friend in high school, a guy named Bruce. Now, Bruce's entire family were members of the LDS church, and I spent a lot of time over there hanging out. From the time that I was introduced to the missionaries to the time that I was baptized was approximately 10 days. I was a golden investigator. I believed everything the missionaries taught me. And when I was baptized in 
into the LDS church, I was baptized into a church that believed in miracles happening, that believed in revelation, that believed in prophecy, and that believed in healings. They had the power. They had the power of the priesthood. They had the power to perform healings in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I believe that 100%, just as much as I believed when I was six, that that Superman costume would give me the power to fly. Not long after I joined the church, I was over at Bruce's house. His mother, a wonderful lady, had something wrong with her hip or her leg. I don't know exactly what it was, but it was causing her a lot of pain. She was hobbling around the house, spending a lot of time in bed or on the couch reclining. But this day, she had called over the missionaries in order to give her a blessing. I was so excited. Here I was going to see the power of the priesthood in action. I was going to see my friend's mother healed by a blessing by these two missionaries who held the power of the priesthood. I watched her hobble across the room to sit in a chair that had been set up in the middle of the living room. The two missionaries blessed her. The first one anointed her with the consecrated oil. Then the second one sealed the anointing and gave her a blessing. And I felt certain that she would get up from that chair, that she would walk away completely healed, maybe give a little skip as she went because of the joy that she would feel at being healed as a sign that not only was she healed, she was actually even better than she had been before. Well, my disappointment that I felt on that Texas front yard when I was six was repeated again when I was in my friend's living room when I was 18. Because what I saw was after the blessing, his mom got up from that chair. She didn't walk. She didn't run. She didn't skip. She didn't click her heels. No, she hobbled away from that chair in just as much pain as she had hobbled to the chair in the first place. That blessing had no effect on her. She was exactly the same before the blessing as she was after the blessing. This was my first experience in coming face to face with the difference between the teachings of Mormonism and the reality of Mormonism, between the difference of Mormonism in theory versus Mormonism in reality. But I honestly could not understand why this healing blessing by the power of the priesthood had no effect on my friend's mother and I took him aside later and I asked him about it. What's the deal, Bruce? Wasn't this blessing supposed to heal her? Wasn't it supposed to make her better? Bruce's comment back to me has stuck with me for these 40 years. What he said was, well, we don't know. It might have helped. Her hip could have been broken. That was Bruce's explanation for what was obviously a failure of the priesthood to do what the church claimed that it was able to do. You know, it might have actually been worse than we thought. Maybe her hip was really broken when she hobbled up to that chair and the priesthood healed her hip so it wasn't broken, but she hobbles away from the chair. It looks just as bad, but you know, actually, her hip could have been healed. And this explanation by my friend Bruce was the first time I came face to face with the fact that Mormons will say anything in order to explain away why it is that the Mormonism they teach is different from the Mormonism that they actually experience. Now, healing is a centerpiece of Mormon doctrine. Healing by the power of the priesthood is one of the signs of the true church. It is one of the signs of those who follow Jesus Christ. It is in the seventh article of faith in the Pearl of Great Price, which says, we believe in the gift of tongues, prophecy, revelation, visions, healing, interpretation of tongues, and so forth. So the LDS Church is on record as believing in these things. Not only does the LDS Church believe in them, Elder Bruce R. McConkie said that they are an evidence of the divinity of the Lord's work. In his Mormon Doctrine, pages 21 to 22, under the entry, Administrations, he says this, Ordinances of administration with actual healings, note the language, with actual healings resulting therefrom, are one of the evidences of the divinity of the Lord's work. The Book of Mormon itself will actually go further than that and will say that where there are no miracles, including healing, no gifts of the Spirit, there is no true church. And not only is there no true church, there is no salvation in any group that does not have those gifts. The reasoning that the Book of Mormon gives for this is that the gifts of the Spirit and salvation are both based on the same thing faith. Gifts of the Spirit require faith. Salvation requires faith. If you don't have faith to have gifts of the Spirit, including healing present, then you don't have faith to have salvation. So therefore, any church that does not have the gifts of the Spirit present, manifest, actually observable, does not have faith necessary for salvation in it. This is in Moroni chapter 7. Now, Moroni 7 is a sermon 
that was given by Moroni's father, Mormon, which is recorded here in the seventh chapter of Moroni. In church, we don't go to the middle of this sermon very often. We go to the very first part where it talks about all good things come from Christ and evil things come from the devil, wherefore lay hold on every good thing. We talk about that scripture quite a bit. That's at the beginning of the chapter. And at the end of the chapter, verse 40a, we frequently hear, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, pray unto the Father with all the energy of heart that you may be filled with this love which he hath bestowed upon all who are true followers of his son, etc., etc. What we don't do a good job of is going into the middle of the sermon, and that is where this doctrine is taught, the idea about faith being required for gifts of the Spirit as well as for salvation. So if you go to verse 21 in Moroni 7, Mormon says, And now I come to that faith of which I said I would speak. And he goes on now to verse 26 and says, And after that he came, that's talking about Jesus, and after that Jesus came, men also were saved by faith in his name. See, salvation comes by faith in his name. This is the point that's being made. And by faith they become the sons of God. And as surely as Christ liveth, he spake these words unto our fathers, saying, Whatsoever thing ye shall ask the Father in my name, which is good, in faith, believing that ye shall receive, behold, it shall be done unto you. So here's the second part. The first part is you're saved by faith. And also, Jesus said to our fathers, whatever you ask the Father in my name, in faith, believing that you shall receive, it will be done unto you. There's the connection between faith and salvation in the first part and faith and miracles in the second part. Verse 27, it goes on to say, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, have miracles ceased? Because Christ hath ascended into heaven and hath sat down on the right hand of God to claim of the Father his rights of mercy, which he hath upon the children of men. Basically, it says, have miracles ceased because Christ has come and gone. And his answer is going to be, no, it has not. That's verse 29. Behold, I say unto you, nay, neither have angels ceased to minister unto the children of men, going down to verse 33. And Christ hath said, If ye will have faith in me, ye shall have power to do whatsoever thing is expedient in me. Again, this idea that faith and miracles are connected. Verse 34. And he hath said, Repent, all ye ends of the earth, and come unto me, and be baptized in my name, and have faith in me, that ye may be saved. You see, once again, he's setting forth this twin foundation, which he set up before. Quoting Christ, Faith is connected to doing whatever is expedient, in Christ, and faith is necessary for salvation. Verse 35, And now, my beloved brethren, if this be the case, that these things are true which I have spoken unto you, has the day of miracles ceased? Going to verse 37, Behold, I say unto you, Nay, for it is by faith that miracles are wrought, and it is by faith that angels appear and minister unto men. Wherefore, if these things have ceased, Woe be unto the children of men, for it is because of unbelief, and all is vain. If miracles have ceased, it can only be because of unbelief. If you have faith, you will have miracles. If you have no miracles, you have unbelief. And if you have unbelief, then you do not have faith that's necessary for salvation. Therefore, if you have no miracles, all is vain. Verse 38, For no man can be saved according to the words of Christ, save they shall have faith in his name. Wherefore, if these things have ceased, then has faith ceased also. And awful is the state of man, for they are as though there had been no redemption made. That's the argument here in Moroni chapter 7. And it really is a rather attractive and cogent argument. If faith is the basis of miracles, including healing, and faith is the basis of salvation as well, then we can detect whether there is faith for salvation by whether there is faith for miracles, including healing. If there are no miracles, there's no salvation. That is how critical miracles are to the foundation of Mormonism. That is perhaps partially why Bruce R. McConkie said it so strongly that healing is one of the evidences of the divinity of the Lord's work. So having established this much, I have to tell you in all honesty that based upon my 40 years experience in the LDS church, although healings are an evidence that the church is true, healings seem to be in very short supply. In fact, healings are on the endangered species list in the LDS church. Now let me tell you about the personal experience of being a priesthood holder in the LDS Church. I expect that most of my listeners who are priesthood holders or who have been priesthood holders will understand 
what I'm talking about. The sisters, or others who have never held the priesthood, may be surprised by what I'm about to tell you. But here's the deal. It is a scary thing to be a priesthood holder and to be called to give a blessing. Now, if it's just a children's blessing to have a good year at school or be safe at summer camp, it isn't so bad. That's pretty easy. Or if one of your children has a cold or something minor, there's no great anxiety involved there. But the more serious a situation is, the greater the anxiety when called upon to give a blessing. At least that's been my experience throughout my life in the Mormon church. What do I do if my blessing doesn't work? That is the question that is usually in the front of my mind at any time when I'm asked to give a blessing to somebody who is in trouble, to somebody who's sick, to somebody who's going in for surgery, to someone who's been diagnosed with a horrible disease. What happens if it doesn't work? What do I do in my mind to legitimize the priesthood that I have by which I'm giving the blessing with the expectation, I've got to tell you, after a while and after seeing priesthood blessings fail time after time, there actually does become an expectation that the blessing is not going to work. And I don't think I'm speaking just for me. I think this has been somewhat universalized in the church all the way up to the leaders of the church who have made certain statements on it that tend to make me think that's the case. And some of those statements we'll get to here in a few minutes. Now, I know I shouldn't be having these thoughts because in some way, just having these thoughts, you know, is this blessing going to work? What do I do if it doesn't work? How do I justify that? Just having these thoughts is already going to kneecap the blessing. How can I have faith to heal somebody if I'm worried that it won't work? Haven't I already failed even before laying my hands on somebody's head? This is the kind of pressure that a priesthood holder can feel that certainly I have felt, and I don't think I'm probably the only one who's felt it, when they're asked to give a blessing to somebody who really, really needs it. It has become pretty evident to me that leaders in the church have come up with a variety of methods to explain away why it is that priesthood blessings are not going to work, that nobody's really going to get healed. The first method is to blame the victim. In other words, the person who is supposed to be healed, the person who is asking for a blessing. And this method really goes all the way back to the New Testament when the person is asked, do you have faith to be healed? And they say, yes, I do. And then they rise up and then they're healed. Well, the idea is if they didn't get healed, then what are we to take away from that story and the question? Do you have faith to be healed? Well, if you're not healed, then obviously you didn't have enough faith. Sorry, your fault. Come back in a year when you have more faith. We'll give it another go. But the idea is that it's the victim's fault. Now, Elder Richard Scott, in 1994, April General Conference, gave a talk about healing in which he makes it clear that you've got to have the faith to be healed, but he also puts on the table a number of other things that you've got to do in order to be healed. Now, on the one hand, I think that Elder Scott wants to say, There's all these different steps that you have to take in order for you to be healed. But on the flip side of that is, if a person is not healed, then there's all these different steps that the person can look to and say, where did I fall short? Which of these steps was I missing? It must be my fault that the healing blessing did not work. Here's the quote from his talk. In summary, do what you can do a step at a time. Seek to understand the principles of healing from the scriptures. That's the first thing you can do. No, that's the first thing you've got to do. Seek to understand the principles of healing from the scriptures and through prayer. Now, frankly, I don't even know what that means. Seek to understand the principles of healing from the scriptures and through prayer. Isn't the principle of healing that someone lays their hands on your head and they bless you and you get better? I mean, is there more than that? I don't know. But again, it's also very helpful if you can keep these steps that are required to be very vague and ambiguous so a person never knows whether they failed or completed that step. If it's such an ambiguous step that you don't know what the heck it's really asking for, then when the healing doesn't happen, that's an easy place to go to and say, well, I guess I must not have done that right because I'll be darned if I can understand what it's even asking for. But Elder Scott goes on, seek to understand the principles of healing from the scriptures and through prayer, help others, forgive, Submit cheerfully and with patience to all the will of the Lord. Above all, exercise faith in Jesus Christ. So he comes back to that above all, exercise faith in Jesus Christ. But there's additional steps. Down below in the next paragraph, he talks about how we have to follow all the commandments. Well, we knew that was coming, didn't we? He says, I testify that the surest, most effective, and shortest path to healing. Well, the shortest path would presumably be immediately. The shortest path to healing comes through application of the teachings of Jesus Christ in your life i.e. follow the commandments. It begins with an understanding of and appreciation for the principles of moral agency and the atonement of Jesus Christ. I don't know what that has to do with 
getting healed, moral agency, but why, why not throw it in there? You've got a certain amount of time to fill in this conference talk, so let's throw that in there. It's a buzzword. It leads to faith in him and obedience to his commandments, and that brings healing, okay? So we got the obedience to the commandments box checked. You've got to obey the commandments to be healed, and the Mormons have so many commandments that they have that if you're not healed, it's obvious you're not keeping one of them, so it must be your fault again. Finally, Elder Scott concludes, look up in faith to Jesus Christ. I know that the master Master loves you and will heal you according to your faith in him. So if you're not healed, then obviously you didn't have enough faith in him. There are a number of different components to being healed in this talk, a number of things you need to do if this is going to work. Foremost among them is to have faith. The master loves you and will heal you according to your faith in him. Well, if he really loves us, why doesn't he just heal us regardless of our faith in him? Because that's not the way it works. Well, why doesn't it work that way? Am I going to hold off on taking my kid to the doctor because he sassed me that morning? Am I going to not give my kid cough medicine because she doesn't believe it will work? No, I am the adult here. I know it will work. I am going to give it anyway. Why? Because I love my children and I want them to get better. I don't care how they've treated me that morning. I don't care what their level of belief is in the cure that I'm going to give them. I'm going to do it anyway because I love them. But doesn't God love us more? more than I love my own children. Isn't that what we're taught in church? Something seems to be out of whack here where I act in a more loving way to my children when it comes to trying to heal them than God will do for us. But Elder Scott goes on in this quote, In order to be healed, I am supposed to, one, seek to understand the principles of healing from the scriptures and through prayer, whatever the heck that means, to help others, three, forgive others, four, keep the commandments. So if I'm not healed, there are a whole list of things I can blame myself for not doing well enough. I don't understand the principle well enough. I didn't help others enough. I didn't forgive others enough. I didn't keep the commandments enough. Each of these situations allows me to place the blame squarely on myself if I am not healed. But there's a flip side to this coin. The same thing goes for priesthood holders who administer blessings that don't work. Any of these can be applied to them as well. Mormon men are taught by their leaders that their power in the priesthood is dependent upon their virtue, their chastity, their obedience to the commandments. They're doing everything that they are supposed to do. And if the blessing does not work, the finger can be pointed not only at the person being blessed who doesn't get healed, but it can be pointed at the priesthood holder who does the blessing and the person doesn't get healed. For example... There was a talk that was given in 1975 General Conference by Von J. Featherstone, a very popular speaker at the time. I wasn't a member of the church for another three years, but this part of the talk was so powerful that I heard about it numerous times after I joined the church. I was surprised to find out when I was researching this, actually a friend of mine found it for me, that the talk itself was given in 1975, as I say, three years before I was baptized. The friend who found it for me is John K. Williams, who has an excellent book out about his mission in South America called Heaven Up Here. I recommend it highly. Going back to Von J. Featherstone. Von J. Featherstone is talking in general conference he's talking to the priesthood session so he is talking to the priesthood holders and his remarks are specifically designed to them and the overall message of his talk is you can't be looking at pornography you can't be masturbating you can't be doing anything that is unworthy because when the time comes for you to use that priesthood you want to have that priesthood and be able to use it he also engages in a shaming tactic of having everybody in the audience imagining a huge scroll appearing on judgment day and all the names of all the people who masturbated showing up on that scroll and everybody can see it. And if you don't masturbate, well, your name won't be up there on that scroll, so you won't be embarrassed in front of everybody come Judgment Day. And he does the same thing for different kinds of sins. But here's the part that I remembered and the part that has to do with tonight's podcast. He says, again, let us talk about a self-inflicted purging. That is the name of his talk, a self-inflicted purging. It's a strange title. What I think he means by <laughs> I should talk about strange titles. But what I think he means by it is that we need to inflict upon ourselves a purging of the sinful things that we do so we don't end up on this imaginary scroll in heaven. Again, let us talk about a self-inflicting purging. My young friends, how about all of you who have committed fornication or have been involved in petting? Suppose their names were on this huge scroll so that all may see. Now I can tell you this, 
I bear my solemn witness that if you do not self-inflict the purging in your lives, the time may well come when there might not be a scroll, but it will be as though there were, it may be as though it had been shouted from the tops of houses, people cannot hide sin. You cannot mock God and hold the Lord's holy priesthood and pretend to propose that you are his servant. Now for the money quote, the story I've been promising here it is. I know of a great man who held his dead son in his arms and said, In the name of Jesus Christ, and by the power and authority of the holy Melchizedek priesthood, I command you to live. And the dead boy opened up his eyes. Now that is a wonderful story about healing. Unfortunately, there's no way to source the story, no way to verify it. He's talking about a great man. I don't know who the heck this great man is. He doesn't give us a name. He doesn't tell us how he knows this story. He doesn't tell us whether the great man told him, whether Von Featherstone was there personally to witness it, whether he heard it third hand, fourth hand, or whatever hand. All he's going to do is bring out this dramatic story and say that he knows a great man who brought his son back to life by the power of the priesthood. And here's the point he's making, which is in the next paragraph. This great brother could not have possibly done that had he been looking at a pornographic piece of material a few nights before. So there's the shame and blame game, not only on the victim or the person who's blessed and is not healed, but on the person who is blessing a person who does not get healed, on the priesthood holder. They can be blamed just as much. So not only does Von Featherstone say this could not have happened had this person been looking at pornographic piece of material a few nights before, or if he had been involved in any other transgression of that kind. The priesthood has to have a pure conduit to operate, end of quote. So I think you can start to get an insight into why it is that when a priesthood holder is called upon to give a blessing, the pressure is really on, because in a priesthood blessing, Results count. Results are observable, unlike a baptism, unlike a confirmation, unlike a prayer on the sacrament bread or water. But as I say, the church has had a long time to work this out, why it is that the priesthood blessings are not working, and therefore they give many avenues and ways of exonerating the priesthood at the expense of the person who's being blessed. Well, the person who's being blessed didn't have enough faith, wasn't following the commandments enough, or it could be the person giving the blessing who didn't have enough faith or wasn't keeping the commandments enough. So there's all these ways to excuse why it is these priesthood blessings do not work. But there is yet another way of exonerating the priesthood from not working. And that is to say, it isn't the Lord's will that the person be healed. In other words, we don't necessarily have to blame anybody here. We don't have to blame the person who's being blessed for not having enough faith to be healed. We don't have to blame the person who's giving the blessing for having looked at pornography the night before. It could be that they are both completely obedient, completely virtuous, but it just wasn't the Lord's will that the person be healed. Elder Dallin Oaks in his April 2010 General Conference address to the priesthood session talked about this at some length. In that talk, he says there are five parts to the use of priesthood authority to bless the sick. One, the anointing. Two, the sealing of the anointing. Three, faith. Four, the words of the blessing. And five, drum roll please, the will of the Lord. So he goes through each of those first four until he comes back to number five, the will of the Lord, which we are going to skip to. He says, young men and older men, please take special note of what I will say now. As we exercise the undoubted power of the priesthood of God. See how he has to say the power is undoubted, even though eh, it doesn't work. Nevertheless, that power is undoubted. As we exercise the undoubted power of the priesthood of God, and as we treasure his promise that he will hear and answer the prayer of faith, we must always remember that faith and the healing power of the priesthood cannot produce a result contrary to to the will of him whose priesthood it is. Now, I want to talk about this for a couple of minutes. At first blush, this makes some degree of sense. We wouldn't think that a man who has the priesthood could use that priesthood to thwart the will of God. In other words, in a giant supersized wizard's duel between Thomas Monson and the Lord Jehovah, it's the Lord Jehovah who is always going to win hands down. But if we take it a step further and we look at what the will of God is, first off, I think we can 
define the will of God as what happens on this earth in its usual course. In other words, God is all-powerful, therefore what happens must be God's will. If something were happening that God did not want to have happen, God would surely intervene and change it to make it the way he wants it to happen. So I think we're pretty safe in concluding that God's will is the way things do happen. Now, in this world, there's a whole lot of people who are sick. And if things are left in their ordinary course, in other words, if God's will is done, a certain number of those people are going to get better. And a certain number of those sick people are going to get worse and even die. Now, that must be God's will for people who are sick who are going to get better to get better and people who are sick who are going to die to die. If that would happen in the ordinary course, that must be God's will. So what we have to do is take this understanding of God's will and now stick priesthood blessings into the middle of it. If a sick person is going to get better anyway and it is God's will that they get better, what point is there in having a priesthood blessing occur if they're going to get better anyway? In other words, if it's God's will that they get better. And conversely, if a person who is sick is going to get worse and die, and that is God's will, if there's no priesthood blessing, what is the point of inserting into that process a priesthood blessing? If a priesthood blessing does not have the power to change the will of God and make a person who was going to die anyway get better, and live. So the bottom line here is that the only way priesthood blessings have any relevance is if they can change the course of what would happen otherwise. In other words, they are relevant and meaningful only if they can change the will of God. This takes us back to some stories in the Old Testament, which are very powerful stories of people changing the will of God. For example, Abraham bargaining with God to save Sodom. Moses bargaining with God to save the children of Israel. In both of those stories, God's will is changed by a human being. And in a similar way, priesthood blessings have efficacy only if they can change the will of God, only if they can take a person who would die otherwise and heal them. But in the last 40 years, what we are fed in church by the leaders of the church seems to be an unending diet of stories about blessings that don't work. For example, President Eyring really tries to mention miracles a great deal in his talks, but they keep coming up short. The miracles of healing that we have related by President Eyring always seem to end up in death, i.e. the healing power doesn't work. In 2011 October General Conference, President Eyring gave a talk called A Witness. In it, he speaks about three miracles, and I have to put that in quotation marks. The first miracle we've talked about before, you can read it for yourself. It basically involves a coincidence. It's not miraculous at all. The second two involve healing stories of people who are very sick who end up croaking, and that's supposed to be the miracle that President Eyring wants us to get from the story. I visited the hospital room of an old friend who had been diagnosed with terminal cancer. Now, this old friend is somebody who's a member of the church, a faithful member of the church, and we know from our experience in the church that this person has had one, if not many, priesthood blessings. Nevertheless, they're not going to help because she will die. But notice this story where President Eyring tries to put a happy spin on the fact that there is no priesthood healing for this dear old friend of his. I took with me my two young daughters. I did not expect that she would even be able to recognize them. Her own family were gathered, standing around her bed as we entered. So that's the scene that they come into. One would expect that an apostle would lay his hands upon this friend, bless her in the name of the Lord Jesus, and she would rise and walk again, and the terminal cancer would vanish. But that's not what happens in our stories told today by modern-day apostles. Instead, people just keep dropping like flies. She looked up and smiled. I will always remember her look as she saw that we had brought our daughters with us. She motioned them to come close to her on the bed. She sat up, held them, and introduced them to her family. Where's the healing? There is no healing. All he's doing is describing what happened, which is very unmiraculous. She sat up, held them, and introduced them to her family. She spoke of the greatness of those two little girls. It was as if she were presenting princesses to a royal court. Where's the healing, President Eyring? I expected our visit to end quickly. Why not give her a blessing, Elder Eyring? Surely, I thought, she is tired. But as I watched, it was as if the years melted away. Okay, so here's where he's trying to insinuate a tiny little miracle here and try and make it sound like something really big happened. 
but as I watched, it was as if the years melted away. She was radiant and obviously filled with love for all of us, even though I couldn't heal her of her terminal cancer. I did add that last part. She seemed to savor the moment as if time had stopped. Well, time stopping is certainly a miracle. She had spent most of her life suckering children for the Lord. I wish general authorities would stop using the word sucker. It's frankly embarrassing. The only two places I have ever heard this word used before are in general conference talks and stories by Edgar Rice Burroughs. She had spent most of her life suckering children for the Lord. And that's actually against the law in most states. She knew from the account in the Book of Mormon that the resurrected Savior had taken little children one by one, blessed them, and then wept for joy. She had experienced that joy long enough herself to be able to endure in his loving service to the end. So here's the other part of the miracle she endured to the end. See, she dies. She doesn't get healed, but at least she endured to the end. So it's a good story. He goes on in the very next sentence. He segues into his next non-miracle story by saying, I saw that same miracle in the bedroom of a man who had given sufficient faithful service to think that he had done enough to rest. Now, I don't know where he thinks the miracle happened. He says, I'm going to see the same miracle if he means by miracle the fact that in spite of priesthood blessings, people die. Yeah, I guess it is the same kind of miracle. He goes on here to say, in the second story, I knew that he had undergone lengthy and painful treatment for a disease and had been told by the doctors that it was terminal. So we got another guy who's terminal, who makes the fatal mistake of calling President Eyring to come in and give him a blessing. <laughs> okay, okay, that's pretty funny. Um, uh, they offered neither treatment nor hope. So the doctors offer neither treatment nor hope, and President Eyring is going to do pretty much the same thing. His wife took me to his bedroom in their home. There he was, lying on his back, on the top of the carefully made-up bed. He wore a freshly pressed white shirt, a tie, and new shoes. He saw the look of surprise in my eyes, laughed quietly, and explained, After you give me a blessing, I want to be ready to respond to the call to take up my bed and go to work. Now, the really horrible thing about this story being told by President Eyring in 2011 General Conference is that that line is a laugh line. It's a punch line. Elder Eyring tells it as a punch line. You can tell when he says it that it's a punch line. And even worse than that is that his audience, full of Mormons holding the priesthood, understand that it's a laugh line. And in fact, they laugh at it. Here is the audio from that talk. Listen to it yourself, and you'll see what I mean. I saw that same miracle in the bedroom of a man who had given sufficient faithful service to think that he had done enough to rest. Stop the tape and ask yourself this question as the story continues. Did this man think he had given enough faithful service that now he had a chance to rest? Or did he think he had given enough faithful service that he merited a blessing of healing from President Eyring? Continuing the tape. I knew that he had undergone lengthy and painful, painful treatment for a disease and been told by the doctors that it was terminal. They offered neither treatment nor hope. His wife took me to his bedroom in their room, in their home. There he was lying on his back on the top of the carefully made up bed. He wore a freshly pressed white shirt, a tie and new shoes. He saw the look of surprise in my eyes, laughed quietly, and explained, After you give me a blessing, I want to be ready to respond to the call to take up my bed and go to work. <laughs> As it turned out, he was ready for the interview he would soon have with the master. <laughs> with the master for whom he had worked so faithfully. So when a person who invites President Eyring over to give him a blessing because he has terminal cancer shows his faith by being completely dressed on top of his bed saying, once you bless me, I'm going to get up and walk. That is no longer a sign of faith to be healed. That is laughable that a person would even think that something like that is going to happen in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints at the hands of a modern apostle of Jesus Christ. After you give me a blessing, I want to be ready to respond to the call to take up my bed and go to work. <laughs> After he waits for the laughter to subside, President Eyring goes on. As it turned out, he was ready 
not to be healed, but he was ready for the interview he would soon have with the master for whom he had worked so faithfully. So basically, this guy's going to croak. President Irene knows he's going to croak. The fact that he thinks he might not croak is considered laughable, and there is no healing for him here. President Eyring concludes this story by saying he was an example of the fully converted Latter-day Saints I meet often after they have given a life of dedicated service. Well, the reason it's only after they have given a life of dedicated service is because President Eyring cannot heal them by the power of the priesthood. That's why it's after they have given a life of dedicated service because their life is over as soon as President Eyring comes to give them a blessing. So, by and large, the miracle stories that we are told today in the LDS Church are miracles that end in death. The miracle is not being healed. The miracle is having given a faithful life of service. The miracle is having years melt away. The miracle is an old woman being able to recognize somebody who comes into the room. Now, I had to split off a little bit back from when I was talking about the will of the Lord in Elder Oak's talk to go down this other line where we were talking about the different stories that we have in General Conference of miracles that don't happen, of healings that don't occur, of blessings that are given and people die anyway. I want to go back briefly to this talk about the will of the Lord because Elder Oak says, as you will recall, that the power of the priesthood cannot produce a result contrary to the will of him whose priesthood it is. We concluded, or at least I did, that unless the priesthood power can change the will of God, then there's no point in having a priesthood blessing in the first place. Elder Oaks tells a story about his cousin who gave a talk at a funeral. Now, this funeral was for a teenager who had died of a serious illness. The teenager had received many priesthood blessings. None of them worked. None of these priesthood blessings healed this teenager. The teenager died anyway. And therefore, because the priesthood blessings did not work, The problem can't be with the power of the priesthood blessings. In other words, it can't be that there is no power in the priesthood. Rather, it must have been that it was the will of God that this teenager die. And here is what Elder Oaks quotes his cousin as having said at the funeral. I know it was the will of the Lord that she die. What a horrible thing to say about God, that it is his will that she die. Notice now that not only are we willing to throw the person who receives the blessing under the bus if the blessing doesn't work, and not only are we willing to throw the person who gives the blessing under the bus if the blessing doesn't work, now we are willing to throw God under the bus if the blessing doesn't work. It just wasn't God's will. God wanted this person to die. The one thing that can never be thrown under the bus and the reason that we throw everything and everybody else under the bus is to preserve the idea that the problem cannot be with the power in the priesthood. That is the one thing that cannot be challenged. There must be, there is, there always will be power in the priesthood. And therefore, when the blessings don't work, it must be some other reason other than the obvious, that there is no power here. There is no there, there, where the bloody hell is the beef. Going on with this quote from Elder Oak's cousin at the funeral, I know it was the will of the Lord that she die. She had good medical care, so that couldn't have been it. She was given priesthood blessings, well, so that couldn't have been it. Her name was on the prayer roll in the temple, so that couldn't have been it. She was the subject of hundreds of prayers for her restoration to health, So that couldn't have been it. And I know that there is enough faith in this family that she would have been healed unless it was the will of the Lord to take her home at this time. So it wasn't a matter of faith. It wasn't a matter of any of the other things that we can usually blame. Therefore, it must have been God who killed her. It was the will of God that she die. Now, you would think that in a talk that's dedicated to the subject of priesthood blessings, Elder Oaks might have given one story about a priesthood blessing that actually worked, a wish for blessings that work. But no, he doesn't do that. Instead, he gives a story about priesthood blessings that don't work and why it is that it's not the priesthood's fault, it's God's fault because this teenager died. And I'm not trying to make fun of the situation. It is a horrible and tragic thing that this family went through and any family goes through who has a child, a teenager, younger than a teenager die. But taking an example like this and using it to try and shield the priesthood from being questioned as to its power and ability to heal people and throwing that blame at the feet of God is unacceptable. And frankly, should I say despicable? Okay, I'll say it. 
despicable. So getting back to the question of why it is that Elder Oaks only tells stories about people who die after receiving priesthood blessings, but doesn't tell any stories about people who get healed by receiving priesthood blessings. Well, he touches on that briefly, because I think he senses that might be a problem, that he only talks about people who die. But instead of telling stories about people who are healed, he comes up with an excuse as to why it is that he doesn't have any stories to tell about people who get healed by the power of the priesthood. And this is what he says. Although we know of many cases where persons blessed by priesthood authority have been healed, comma, he's not going to tell you the stories, he's not going to tell you the instances, he's just going to say, hey, we know about these, but we're not going to tell them to you. Why? He continues, we rarely refer to these healings in public meetings because modern revelation cautions us not to boast ourselves of these things, neither speak them before the world. For these things are given unto you for your profit and for salvation. DNC 8473. Well, actually, the reason they don't refer to these or speak about these stories publicly is because they don't happen. If President Oak's excuse were really true, then the church would never talk about priesthood healings that happened in church history. And yet anybody who's gone to Sunday school, anybody who's been a Mormon for any length of time knows that the church cannot get enough of talking about miracle healing stories in the early days of the church, specifically when Joseph Smith was the prophet. Every Mormon, I presume, who's at least stayed awake through Sunday school class, knows about the story of Mrs. Johnson brought to Joseph Smith in the spring of 1831 who had a stiff arm which was healed by Joseph Smith. Certainly, every Mormon has heard about July 22nd, 1839 on the banks of the Mississippi when all the saints, they're in their beds, they're dying, they're sick because of malaria. Joseph Smith gets up and goes and starts healing people right and left and even sends his handkerchief across the Mississippi to be used to heal people over there. It's called the Great Day of the Lord's Power. For crying out loud, we even tell the story about Mary Fee healing the ox on the way across the plains. This church has no compunction whatsoever about telling stories of healing if it suits them. So when Elder Oak says the reason we don't talk about healing stories is because we're told not to tell them publicly, well, that's just not the case. The church tells all sorts of old healing stories publicly. What they don't have today for public consumption is any modern healings done at the hands of the modern apostles. Instead, what we get is a steady diet of blessings that don't work. Just like Opus the Penguin cannot fly with his little penguin wings, the modern leaders of the church cannot produce any healings by their priesthood power. I mean, really, if the apostles actually had the power to heal by the priesthood, wouldn't we see them going down to the Salt Lake Children's Hospital and healing all the children there who are there with disease and life debilitating illnesses? And if they do have the power and they're not going to the hospital, what excuse do they have for not going? As a friend of mine once said, any true apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ who goes into a hospital should not be walking out by himself. Now we are on the last stretch of this podcast, and now we come to what I promised at the beginning, which is Elder Bednar, who puts the icing on the cake when it comes to excuses as to why priesthood blessings do not work. This is from a devotional that he gave in 2013 at the University of Texas at Arlington. It is from a talk titled, That We Might Not Shrink. Elder Bednar will tell this story at length, and I'm going to play some audio as he tells the story. But the basic idea of this story is that, as all Mormons know, there is a hierarchy of priesthood in the LDS Church. And with that comes the common understanding that priesthood power increases as you go up the chain of authority. In other words, getting a priesthood blessing from your home teachers is one thing. Getting a priesthood blessing from your bishop, better. Stake president, better. But if you move your way up the ladder to getting a priesthood blessing from an apostle of Jesus Christ, now you know that you are in real contention for actually getting healed. Nobody's going to be closer to God and Jesus Christ on this earth than an apostle of the LDS church. They are the ones who can lay their hands on you and heal you for sure. So if you can get an apostle to give you a blessing when you are sick, you are in like Flynn. The Lord is definitely going to heal you, just like when the apostles in the New Testament blessed people and they were healed immediately. Now, there's no record that I'm aware of of home teachers or bishops or state presidents blessing people and being healed in the New Testament, but apostles, absolutely. 
And the story that Elder Bednar tells is about a young man who's a wonderful young man. He's faithful. He's Mormon. He went on a mission. He returns from his mission. He gets married in the temple. He does everything that he is supposed to do. And shortly after he's married in the temple, he gets diagnosed with cancer. Well, this young man knew Elder Bednar through some way from the mission field. The young man has had a blessing from his bishop. He's had a blessing from his stake president. He's still having all sorts of trouble with the cancer. Those blessings have not helped. He's in the hospital. Lo and behold, he gets a visit from Elder Bednar. And he asks Elder Bednar for a blessing. Because within the LDS context, he has now grabbed the brass ring. This young man knew that if he could get an apostle of Jesus Christ to bless him, it would work. His cancer would be cured. He would be made whole. He'd be able to go on and live his life as a faithful Latter-day Saint the way he had planned. Elder Bednar does not use the real names of this young man and his wife. Instead, he refers to the young man as John and the young woman as Heather. He even quotes from the young man's journal as to what his expectations were when he was blessed by an apostle of Jesus Christ. I was sure that since Elder Bednar was an apostle, he would bless the elements of my body to realign, and I would jump out of the bed and start to dance or do something dramatic like that. If you were listening closely, yes, that was laughter that you heard in the audience of young people that Elder Bednar was addressing. They also understand that this is a laugh line. Elder Bednar also quotes a similar feeling from Heather, the young man's wife, as to what would happen when Elder Bednar blessed her husband. Heather wrote... This day was filled with mixed emotions for me. I was convinced that Elder Bednar, was, Elder Bednar would place his hands on John's head and completely heal him of the cancer. I knew that through the power of the priesthood he could be healed, and I wanted so bad for that to happen. But unfortunately, the apostle who came to visit him was not Peter, James, or John from the New Testament. Instead, it was Elder Bednar from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And the blessing took a strange turn even before Elder Bednar laid his hands on this young man's head. Instead of Elder Bednar asking if this young man had faith to be healed, Elder Bednar puts a strange twist on the question and instead asks him if he has the faith not to be healed. I am not making this up. Here's a young man expecting to be healed, and what he hears out of the apostle's mouth is, John, do you have the faith not to be healed? Well, Elder Bednar, i got to break it to you. The world is full of people who have faith not to be healed. They're dropping like flies everywhere. The question isn't whether a person has faith not to be healed. The question is whether a person has faith to be healed. That's the issue. I can think of no question that is more likely to subvert and undermine faith than asking a person if they have the faith not to be healed. And Elder Bednar will tell this story as if it's a great story, as if it's a miraculous story, as if it's an insightful and penetrating story. And he will even quote from the journals of the young man and his wife. And he will talk about how shocked they were when it was that he asked this question, how they thought he was coming in to heal them, how this young man believed that he would be healed by the priesthood blessing of an apostle of Jesus Christ, and how that belief was completely crushed by Elder Bednar's question. Do you have faith not to be healed? This is what John thought initially when he heard this strange question being asked him by Elder Bednar. John continued, having the faith not to be healed seemed counterintuitive Well, calling the question, do you have faith not to be healed, counterintuitive, is putting it nicely. Heather, the wife, put it much more explicitly. After he taught us about the faith to not be healed, I was terrified. Well, that I can understand. They've got an apostle of Jesus Christ who's come to visit the husband, John, in the hospital room who's dying of cancer. They ask him to give a blessing, and he asks John if he has the faith not to be healed. Of course his wife would be terrified. This was their last hope going up in smoke. And I may as well say it now as later. Any person, whether an apostle or not, who asks somebody if they have the faith not to be healed, does not have the faith to heal them in the first place. Elder Bednar goes on to explain why it is that he asked John this question. Because, as he explains it, if it is God's will that John die, there is nothing that Elder Bednar can do to stop it. There is nothing about his priesthood 
that can heal John. And in the process, Elder Bednar renders priesthood blessings completely ineffective and priesthood power completely unnecessary. Righteousness and faith certainly are instrumental in healing the sick, deaf, or lame. If such healing accomplishes God's purposes and is in accordance with his will. Well, Elder Bednar, the logical extrapolation from what you have just said is that righteousness and faith has nothing to do with healing somebody. If it is God's will, they will be healed. If it is not God's will, they will not be healed, which means that righteousness, faith, and priesthood have nothing to do with it, only God's will. What are you doing there in the hospital in the first place? But as bad as this is, it gets worse. Elder Bednar will go on to teach that in order to have faith to be healed, one first has to have faith not to be healed. In doing so, Elder Bednar teaches that having faith not to be healed is actually greater and must precede faith to be healed. But as John and Heather and I counseled together and wrestled with these questions, we increasingly understood that if God's will were for this good young man to be healed, that blessing could only be received if this valiant couple first had the faith not to be healed. Well, that's a remarkable teaching. I don't think we'll find that in any of the scriptures. At least I cannot recall Jesus or any of the apostles or any of the other prophets in the scriptures healing somebody, but first asking them if they have the faith not to be healed. This seems to have been something that was completely unknown in all of religion for thousands of years until 2013 when Elder Bednar first pronounced it to the world. One other comment I need to make about this sound clip is that Elder Bednar has now completely contradicted himself. First he says that there is nothing that can change God's will. Faith cannot change God's will. Righteousness cannot change God's will. The priesthood of God cannot change God's will. The only thing that can change God's will, according to Elder Bednar, is if the person being blessed does not have the faith not to be healed. Let me play that sound clip again so you can see what I mean. We increasingly understood that if God's will were for this good young man to be healed, that blessing could only be received if this valiant couple first had the faith not to be healed. So apparently there is one way that God's will can be thwarted by mere mortals. According to Elder Bednar, if God's will is that a person be healed, the person first must have faith not to be healed. Therefore, if the person does not have the faith not to be healed, God cannot heal them. This is the theology that is being taught by Elder Bednar. So if you listen closely, Elder Bednar has actually performed a very neat trick here. What he has done is he has taken faith not to be healed and made it greater than faith to be healed. So if a person receives a priesthood blessing and dies, they actually have greater faith than a person who receives a priesthood blessing and lives. And I have to admit, that's a pretty good idea in a church where the leaders tell stories about giving priesthood blessings to people and they all die. Obviously, faith is still alive in the LDS church. The priesthood is still alive in the LDS church because blessings are given and people are dying like flies. And so, after 40 years of being a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and after having reviewed the evidence and placed it before you tonight, I am led to ask the eternal question, where have all the flowers gone? Where have all the soldiers gone? Where have all the priesthood healings gone? This is Radio Free Mormon, signing off the air. Thank you.